Welcome to Video Poem. We have a very special guest today, George Ortega, and the topic is going to be on poverty. Hi, George. How you doing, Bob? So uh, I wanted to have you on to talk about poverty, how it's under the radar and it's overlooked by the commercial media. Why don't you tell my guests some, like, uh, some interesting facts that you've acquired about that? All right. Um, this is something that most people don't know, but it's like... It's the biggest tragedy, the biggest injustice in the world. I mean, look, there are 29,000 kids dying every day from poverty. You know, that, that comes to like 10.5 million a year. And I mean, when you want to put it into like historical perspective, Hitler and the Nazis killed what, about 12 million people in however many years they did? This is going on every year, 10, 10 million kids. And, you know, it's not that the facts aren't out there. This has been going on for decades. Why do you think that's not reported as much in the media? And the follow-up question to that is, if you think it was reported, do you think it would affect people's actions and awareness of it? Absolutely. Um, the reason it's not reported is because pretty much the rich own the world. The rich own the media. The rich own the government. You know, the rich own corporations. And they, they're, they're actually misinformed. They think that ending global poverty would cost them a lot of money when the fact is that they, we could together end global poverty and, and they wouldn't even miss the money. It's such a small amount. So you think they have an agenda in keeping this poverty going? I mean, you're saying like if we educated them? I mean, why wouldn't they be aware of that? All right. One of the reasons they're not aware of it is because our politicians generally aren't aware of it. They, you know, we get new Congress people into Congress each, you know, election cycle. And there are a lot of issues out there. There are a lot of lobbyists. So they're like, you know, people are coming from them um, to them left and right. And <clears throat> this, like, there's one fact that explains the, the global poverty situation very clearly in terms of how little we do and how little it takes to get done. This is like the 0.7% pledge. Let me ex explain that. Um, back in 1970, through the UN, the 22 richest countries um, determined, they did a study um, commissioned by the UN, it was headed by Canada, and they, they determined that all it would take to end global poverty was 0.7% of the annual income of the richest 22 countries. You mean like the gross domestic uh, product. product? Exactly. The GDP every year, less than 1%. And those 22 countries promised that amount, you know? back in 1970, and they pledged to, to actually fulfill it by 1975. Now, we, here we are 37 years later, and they haven't given even half of that. Well, what's interesting, that brings up an interesting thing, is how it gets reported in our media, and a lot of Americans think like how generous we are. But if you actually study like the policies of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, a lot of what we give through that is tied to take away the resources of those countries, you know, to, to sustain our lifestyle here. Like, for instance, like a case is like down in Venezuela, like, um, or like in, in those countries too, like where we privatize the water, the electricity, and you, you find like those gains flowing back to corporations here were basic necessities for the, uh, for the people down there. They'd have to do without. Oh, absolutely. And also, like, Africa is the part of the world that needs the most help. I mean, there's a lot of poverty in China and Asia, but in Africa, the poverty is so extreme, they don't have even the resources to, to begin. But we will, we will pump a lot of money, for example, into Israel, into countries that, that don't really need it. It's, it's really, we, a lot of our foreign aid, as you're saying, it, it's for our benefit. It's not for the benefit of, of the recipients. And it's not even really for, when you say our benefit, it's really for the core benefit. Don't you mean? Benefit of the rich, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for instance, like, uh, you know, like, well, when you go into, like, Noam Chomsky, he talks about, like, we create client states. Israel's a client state in the sense of they'll be our proxy in that part of the world to do our bidding and stuff. So, therefore, we give them aid. And uh, But is that in the interest of the average, average American? You know, by giving this aid to the Israelis, nothing against them, it creates this hostility with like the Arab population, right. which is directed towards the whole American population when in reality they're giving the aid to Israel for the benefit of, let's say, the oil lobby, who yeah. wants the, a strong man in that region. Yeah, and the reality is, again, we're talking about 0.7% of our income each year. I mean, for a per 
to make it understandable, if, if, that, if our income was $50,000 as an individual, that would, be, that would be $350 a year. Doesn't America so, also like, uh, rank like, like way low on the list of what we give? I think I, I heard 37. I don't know if that's right. All right. Well, there are 22 um, donor countries that signed this pledge. Until 2004, the United States gave the least. We were at the very bottom of that yeah. list. Now we're second to bottom. You know, yeah. But meanwhile, like you'll get the reporting, let's say, on Fox and other corporate things, like how generous we are, what we're doing. And I think a lot of Americans go around with that notion in their head, with that sound bite in their head. And then when, um, you know, something happens, then they get like, oh, you know, we're misunderstood, uh, people are ungrateful. When in yeah, absolutely. Here's a, here's a perfect example. The average person thinks that we give 25% of our federal budget to foreign aid. The reality is we give less than 1%. So people are incredibly misinformed. Right, that brings up an interesting thing too. Like for instance, like Bush, uh, I think it was like in uh, State of the Union three years ago, said something like where he was going to give all this money for AIDS, um, stuff in uh, Africa, and he said that, but in reality, when the budget comes due, the Appropriations Committee, they gave 1% of the figure that he stated, but that is not reported. In other words, people hear that when he gives the State of the Union uh, speech in January, they hear this great glowing number, oh wow, we're going to do it, and then when push comes to shove, you know, three or four months later, when they actually go to sign the money, it's like minuscule compared to what they're saying. But that is not reported. People aren't aware. So they're going around with this notion like, oh, we're doing something about it when, in fact, we're not. Yeah, and the problem is that the, the rich pretty much own the press. I mean, we think it's a free press, but if it's owned by individuals like Murdoch who are incredibly wealthy and have their agenda, I mean, we're not going to get the news. I mean, what we, what we need, I mean, like, you know, 150, 200 years ago or so, we had um, revolutions against the monarchies. You know, and but it, it, you know, most people think it it went from like the monarchies to the people that there was really democracy to the people. It wasn't. It was the rich took power from the monarchy. They have the power now. We need a new revolution against the rich. You know, because they're they're just like destroying the. Right. Planet. You were, you mentioned an interesting point in an email to me. I say it's not going to be a violent revolution. Then how did you describe how it was going to no, be? No, and it's it's political. I think we've advanced beyond the point where we have. We don't need to like you know destroy millions of lives to change the world. I mean, you know, with, with the internet, with politics, with with just like you know mobilization and activism, we could do it. But the thing is, we have to get involved. We have to understand the the facts and. But you're also mentioning it would be a psychological revolution. Well, yeah. A lot of times um, we have a culture that kind of, in a sense, like idolizes the rich. We look up to them. We, we admire them. We, we kind of want to be like them. Right. Lifestyles and the rich and the famous, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's got to change. And I think what's, what's going to help change that is global warming. Do you think that's going to change it? Because they were saying, like, for instance, like when Thomas Frank and What's the Matter with Kansas was talking about this phenomenon in the last 30 years, how... Um, Lower working class people and even poor people have voted, say, for the Republican Party, which is completely against their economic interests, and they've gone for it. And he explored that topic in his book, and he was what he was saying was he found like a myth, like where people want to believe they want to believe in that American dream, like okay, I'm not so fortunate right now, but I I will have the opportunity to get there, or if not me, my child. And then he actually spored the data was saying, no, most people don't get in that myth. Their children don't get in that myth. Their grandchildren don't get in that myth. Exactly. You know, but that is perpetrated. And then you get, like, uh, the focus on lifestyles, which is famous, and the cult of celebrity and stuff. And people, like, just going off from that. I was watching um, TV last night, and, like, you know, if I heard one more antidote about Michael Vick and the dog story, which is, you know, that is a tragic story, and I don't mean to minimize that, but, like, I was just looking at it like there's so much more going on. Like I was talking to my yoga teacher today too, was saying like how she noticed in the news they were saying, Oh, fortunate Hurricane Dean is going to Cancun as if the people in Cancun didn't matter. Right. right. You know, oh it's not going to these rich resort towns like in, you know, uh, Louisiana or Texas. Like, oh, it's the poor people like they don't matter. A lot of the problem is in the United States is we're very nationalistic. It's always about us first. Again, there's 29,000 kids dying every day of poverty. 
3,000 of us died in 9-11, and like, you know, we're, we're, you know, we can't get over that. You know, it's 3,000 in one day versus like 29,000 every day. I mean, we have to get over this mindset that it's, that it's America first and, and, you know, the rest of the world has to wait. Right, and also there's a thing too, like how Americans like uh, Gore Vidal can coin the phrase the United States of Amnesia. Oh, yeah. In other words, there's no, Americans don't have any historical awareness. Like, you know, you had the tech boom, collapse. What goes on now? They rush right into this mortgage housing thing. Now it's collapsing and they're crying again. Like, you know, you look at it, didn't you learn your lesson seven years ago? Now what, you know? Well, again, I mean, the reason for that is, like, the media is going to play up what's in the best interest of the people who own the media. So if it's not in the best interest to, to point up things that are going to end global poverty or take care of children's health care, they're not going to do it. Well, are you aware of the fact, too, since there's been this consolidation of media, that to make more profits for their shareholders, they've been cutting back on the foreign bureaus? Like, as a matter of fact, there's only uh, two news organizations that maintain, like, a, a bureau in Iraq. That's the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. No one else is, like, so, as just like, say, you were talking about this global poverty problem, particularly in Africa, there's less and less even means of covering it because uh, they want to maximize the profits to the shareholders. They're not really caring about the news. Like, I saw a thing on um, C-SPAN uh, two nights ago where they're saying, like, how when they hire graduates out of the journalism programs, they don't want someone who can go and do research. They want someone who looks sexy and who can tell uh, a cute story. And yeah. that's what this guy was saying. Like he's a professor and he, you know, the companies come to him, they tell him what they want and he has to train people to be like that because he wants to do well by his graduates. But it, he was saying how it sickens him because he knows like they're going out there to do fluff piece. Oh yeah, and absolutely. And when they do a piece, they might do a piece of a, a malnourished child and then maybe like uh, a care worker or something, something like that, very topical, very, you know, direct showing people. But they never, they don't g give stories about how, why that situation is like that. For example, um, we trade with our trading partners that are often the rich countries. And we you mean like the Western European, like the G7? or Yeah, exactly. Our, our, our major trading partners that are not poor countries, and we charge them, like, if an African country wants to trade with us, they'll have to pay, for example, tariffs that are nine times higher than our rich partners. Um, Africa, Africa, as poor as they are, if we really had free trade, if the United States and the rich countries traded with them, they could lift themselves out of poverty completely. They wouldn't need our help. Now, what parts of Africa are you talking about? Like, when you say Africa, I mean, it's a continent. Right. So, I mean, there's South Africa, then there's Egypt, then there's Morocco. Sure, it's basically sub-Saharan. Sub-Saharan, that's where the, the major... Because you know, it's very is. interesting, like, how... Uh, where we have some, some interest in Africa, it's like Nigeria. Lo and behold, there's oil there. Now Chad, they discovered oil there. And the case, like, for instance, in Nigeria is very sad is that we, in collusion with like the Western European nations, have helped propped up um, violent military dictators who have given their oil to our oil companies at a very good price, and we've looked the other way while they've tortured people, uh, funneled no resources back to, to the uh, population, um, just taking the profits either for, for the oil company here or for like a very small elite in that country and stuff so and you don't get that reporting so w when there's anger comes back and then you get like oh we're like this generous country why are they acting yeah, this way yeah we blame we blame those countries why are they acting them? this way and yeah. i just think about it like, i was like coming through white plains the other day and like i felt like swamped by the land of the huge suv yeah you know, it's like it's but, that awareness like going like i don't care about these people that in Nigeria, as long as I can drive comfortably in my huge SUV. Nothing against huge SUVs, but like I'm saying, isn't that, I mean, we're not in the 90s anymore, cheap oil, you know, what's going on here? We're worse than the Nazis. Again, we don't care. We really just don't care. Um, it's kind of ironic, because like 90% of us are, are religious, you know. We, we tend to believe that there's a God and there's justice, whatever. And if that's the case, we're in for some hard times because, like, the way we've treated, you know, half of the planet, 1.1 billion who are living on less than a dollar a day, you know, these, again, the kids are dying at a rate of 29,000 every day. 
I mean, if there's justice, then you know what goes around comes around, and 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 you know we can expect that things may so not. So you're not so buying like the free market argument that globalization is going to like it's a rising tide and it's going to lift everyone up. If it was, I mean, the the gains have been made in global poverty have been made mainly in China, and because of the the globalization, because of um, free trade, they've they've done a lot, but. You know, free trade is far from free. I mean, again, um, China's had a lot more leverage than the African countries. If, if we applied the free trade pr trade principles to Africa, again, they could lift themselves out of poverty. But it's interesting with China, too. Like, now that the jobs are leaving there because uh, it's too expensive for these people there. So they're now pretty much going to Vietnam and Malaysia. That's right. I mean, the, the jobs, I mean, like... So there's already that's fine. unrest in China now because it's not having that same model and another interesting fact is too in the in the desperation to get china to develop we had them develop on an oil economy where they they could have come in on a green one well yeah that's the problem I mean, like right now I mean, global warming is going to be a problem for decades you know it it if we don't do something soon we risk shrinking the global economy by about 20 percent Okay, so it's serious. Now the problem is that here in the United States, our per, per capita income is about forty-two thousand. Okay, in China it's about four thousand. The problem with that is that as of this year, China is now emitting as much CO two into the atmosphere as the United States, and so I mean, like, while we may have the money to to cut down our emissions substantially enough to to address it, China cannot do that and feed its people. So. And keep its growth exactly like they're addicted to i think like they need to have like 10 to 14 percent growth every year right and right. that's what they're planning on another interesting thing too is they're going to be competing for the same oil resources that we are like we turn like our back on iran mm -hmm. well guess who steps into the void china's there yeah and in a way, it's better if they do, because again, it, we're, we're people, we're not Americans first, we're human beings first. So if the poor countries take all the trade, if, if the United States gets much poorer, you know, that's good for a lot of people. That, that'll save a lot of lives. Well, what's interesting too is like they also hold up, say, um, India as this great model, like particularly Thomas Friedman of the Times. But the same thing, like similar to here, is that the, the benefits of the globalization in that continent is only going to a few. And that's only that what gets reported here is like the successes of pockets of India. And there's actually more starvation, more destitution in that country than before and stuff. But that doesn't get reported. You know, just the gains to a certain elite gets manifested here. And, and that's all gets trumpeted. So people hear that and that's all they think. Yeah. And again, like the, 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 the people who keep other people poor in India are the rich. You know, India could have addressed its poverty decades ago. It's finally making some progress, not nearly enough. But just like we have our the rich in, in our country that just wants more and more at the expense of everything else, everyone else, you know, there are people like that in every country of the world. That's why we need a revolution against the rich, you know, a global revolution. Well, yeah, it's interesting now that you, you know, when you bring the focus up in this country, how we were talking before about how the, the big economic gains of the last 30 years of this country have gone to the top 100% of this country. Top 1%, you're saying? Or, or no, 100% of that, 0.0001. Right, right. Yeah. And stuff. Even within the rich, there's levels and stuff. So even within their class, the Times did a whole um, expose on that. Even within them, you have rich, but it's not merely um, satisfactorily enough like that 5 or $10 million. That's actually poor. By those people's standards and stuff, and uh, and what do you have? They're cutting taxes more. I was I was telling you a fact that you know corporations have had their taxes since 1962 slashed by two thirds of the revenue that they contribute to the federal budget. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I know 85 percent of corporations don't pay any taxes at all. Um, the Democrats are far from perfect. The Democrats should have been championing global poverty for decades. But right now, the, the, main, the main problem with the rich controlling the world in this country is the Republicans. You know, they're the ones that are giving the... I'm not saying... That the well, you and I differ on that. All right, but I'm not saying that the Democrats are perfect, but, like, you know, in order to, to defend the planet, again, especially within the, um, the perspective of global warming and, and the Republicans, you know, the Democrats are much more in favor of doing what's necessary. I mean, you can't do everything 
at once. You can't like you can't um, in a sense weaken both the Democrats and the Republicans at the same time because one of them is going to rise to power. And like to the extent that the Democrats win and the Republicans lose power, all right, then we don't have to worry about the Republicans. Just like we don't have to worry about the fascists or the Nazis anymore. Then we work on the Democrats. We work on making them a lot more compassionate. So you're saying work within the system in that case? We have to work by steps. We've got to first get rid of the Republicans, you know, their ideology. Well, I'm just saying, like, when, when, the, when the conversation veers into that topic, for instance, like one of Hillary Clinton's biggest contributors is Rupert Murdoch. So when he just acquired the Dow Jones, not a word out of her. I'm saying if we're going to be one of the themes of this, uh, what we've been talking about is media consolidation and reporting certain interests, well... She just rolled over on that. Oh, yeah, again, like, again. So how are we going to change it? I don't want to get too, that's another topic for another show. Well, no, it, no. I mean, like, it's very relevant to, relevant to global poverty because um, you've got the parties, right? But the rich control both parties. But I'm saying, like, for instance, in the Democratic primary right now, the only candidate, or speaking in of poverty, is John Edwards. Right. And what? Right. How? And how do they treat him? They talk about his haircut. I know, that's they a call big him the problem. haircut candidate. Like, he just did this thing... Um, where he reenacted this famous um, trip that Robert Kennedy did in 68, with, like really destitute um, counties of, in Kentucky and stuff, and uh, they mocked him. They, they made fun of him. I know, I know. They That's made how fun they of are. him, the That's Newsweek journalists, saying this is so boring, this is yeah. ridiculous. And, I mean, you've got people in power, you've got people who work for the people in power that, that are just callous, they're indifferent, they're, they're not compassionate, they don't care, they're selfish, they're greedy. And, you know, again, like it's, you know, if we don't, there's, there's a saying that goes that like, you know, uh, the only thing it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to sit by and do nothing. And, you know, I can't even consider that we're being good if we're not doing anything because we're just like, you know, being apathetic. But you must find the Internet getting promoting awareness of this poverty. Well, yeah, there's at least um, amongst people who are interested. Absolutely. Bono um, created a one, one campaign, you know, brought together about, I think, two and a half million people to sign a pledge, and they've had concerts, and they're trying to raise awareness. There is there is stuff going on. I mean, like, before 9-11... But, I mean, the concert thing to me is, like, kind of like bull, because, like, you get people, like, again, driving out there in the SUV, sitting out in the parking lot, girls on beer, and then going in, and, and then thinking, like, oh, well, I gave 60 bucks for this one day event and then they go back and not changing their 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 lifestyle i mean it's better than nothing but i don't those kind of concerts aren't really really don't do the trick for me I, and and also like it's not it's not anymore about like raising money you know as many charitable contributions as people give as individuals it doesn't it's not going to solve the problem it's really about awareness it was it's about and that a certain and a mindset wouldn't you say and like how we need to change the paradigm absolutely oh yeah we've got to we've got to see ourselves as people first and americans second right so more like how see as part of a globe and not isolated right like we're over here on this continent and not you know what happens over in africa you know it's like a tarzan movie it doesn't affect me right. i mean you know relating this you know to what terrorism. I mean? like how like how like the people's perceptions are, oh, yeah. are determined like a lot by like hollywood and stuff absolutely and, like, you know it's amazing how a lot of people's view of africa is from those tarzan movies yes and i'm not kidding you no that's very true you're it's right like, <laughs> that's very you know, they true. think you it's think like it's... you know jane and cheetah walking around you know they don't they get really surprised too like if if you show them pictures of Africa, they have all these modern cities and stuff, and actually it's a very modern society in the most case. But they have an image like it's like this, you know, like a, you know, Khartoum and, you know, you know, you know, like, you know, born to be free, like the tiger. <laughs> I know. And again, it's it's like, you know, and, and you, you have like so many people in the world that really hate us. And, and I mean, can you blame them? I mean, like with, with the terrorism and stuff, people hate us because we're so greedy and we're so selfish. And like, you know, we just, we care about ourselves. Do we really care about ourselves? Actually, it's interesting because now, now with global warming, we're... I mean, we're, look at the people you're talking about when we, when we talk about poverty here. Look at New Orleans. Right. Yeah, seventy nine percent of the people have not been allowed back into that town. Right. So so it's like in a sense like the rich are controlling the media, controlling the politics, controlling what goes on. And so, also like distribution of the wealth. Like that's some reason we have an over bloated military budget. And they were saying, like, for instance, like why well, we can't have universal health care for every American because we're feeding our addiction in Iraq. Yeah, and that's insane. I mean I, I don't know if you saw a And that's one thing I want to get back to you, but the Democrats, like when Hillary doesn't come out against the war, 
she's promoting that. You know, how does she support a progressive cause? Yeah, well, I, you know, I have to agree with you. The Democrats are far from perfect. The church, I mean, who, who met so many people think is so charitable and stuff, they're more interested in bringing prayer into schools and in, in preventing gays from getting married than And also in, the than distribution of condoms and stopping AIDS, which is a big con contribution of poverty in Africa. Right. Yeah. And then that ties into also, like, how we can't get generic drugs into Africa to prevent... Uh, diseases like that too so you know it's all kind of like an interlocking thing you know yeah the the rich um they don't they certainly don't care about the poor now it seems like they don't care about their future generations their children and grandchildren because like poverty is not going to affect them but global warming r does threaten them and um they're they're in denial they, they don't want to know because again the, the um, there was a study done by uh, an economist in, in Britain, um, it was called the Stern Report, and he determined that all that's necessary to address global warming is 1% of the world's annual income. That's like nothing, you know? And if we don't do that, we, again, risk shrinking the, the global economy by 20%. Now, if, if the so rich... So it's, it's an all in our interest then to give absolutely. that percent. And, and that's and like, actually, like, wouldn't, wouldn't that be like the job of the politicians but I see like we're starting to run down on our time so uh if we want to wrap up it's, like, it's obviously a topic yeah we talk absolutely about yeah we're i mean twenty nine thousand kids are dying every day of poverty 10 million each year you know our society our world is more horrible than the nazis have been and the rich are pretty much leading us to um to something that's um threatening the planet we've, we've got to address it yeah and even when, when you talk about the rich it's more like the shareholders well, yeah, but uh, but see, it's the shareholders, but then there's the rich like Murdoch who own the media, who just pretty much mold the the public consciousness, you know. Yeah. And we've got. We've I think got we're gonna have, have to have you back on for more topics. So, it's been a great talk, video poem, like George guest George Ortega, he's the man, and we're gonna have him back on so we can help get awareness for this. Thank you very much. See you next week.